On behalf of the director, Susan Weber, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you here tonight uh, for the 14th Paul and Irene Hollister Lecture in Glass. My welcome is to you here in the room uh, on West 86th Street and those of you watching uh, from somewhere else. Uh, we here on West 86th Street uh, on the island of Manhattan, Manahata, recognize that we are in Lenape Hoking, the ancestral lands of the Lenny Lenape people. Also on West 86th Street, we know that we are just a long stone's throw from the furthest fields of Seneca Village, the village of freed African-Americans and Irish immigrants that uh, occupied uh, a part of Central Park near Cent uh, Central Park West and was plowed under in the making of the park for the people. Uh, let me say a moment, i say something for a moment now about the people for whom tonight's lecture is named. Paul Hollister was a painter with the mind of a scientist and a scientist with the eye of a painter. He was born in New York in 1918 into a family of collectors. His stepfather was a founder of Old Sturbridge Village. As a painter, he had many one-man shows, including in London, 1951, New York, 1953, 1982, and in Boston in 1988. In 1939, in the prize winner show at the Village Art Center, Paul Hollister received the third prize, and at the Critics Show at the Grand Central Art Galleries in 1949, the New York Herald Tribune's art critic, Emily Genauer, chose his as one of her two selections for the show. His paintings, and later in life he turned from oils to pastels, are in many private collections, as well as in the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston. As a scientist, his degree from Harvard was a Bachelor's of Science, Paul taught and thought about glass. He published four books on glass paperweights and lectured widely at international glass congresses in East Berlin in 1977, Liverpool in 1979, Segovia in 1985, Basel 1985, Vienna 1991, Milan 1995. This last on Vermeer's windows and their reflections, as well as at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Toledo Museum of Art, the Smithsonian Institution, the New York Historical Society, the Albany Institute of History and Art, and the High Museum in Atlanta. His bibliography, com uh, compiled by the Corning Museum of Glass, numbers nearly 2,000 publications and extends to four double column pages. And so when the Bard Graduate Center was founded in 1993, he was an obvious candidate to join the faculty. And he taught here in the first two years of the Bard Graduate Center's existence. It was to honor his contribution to the study of glass and to commemorate his relationship with the BGC that Irene Hollister, Paul's wife of 53 years, much of which was spent professionally as a management consultant and director of the Association for Computing Machinery, established the Paul and Irene Hollister Endowment for Lectures on Glass. This endowment enables us to continue his legacy by offering lectures to students and the general public that bring new insight to the study of glass a new insight to the study of glass we will surely get tonight from our speaker, Vera Keller, who is Associate Professor of History at the University of Oregon. She's a historian of science, technology, and knowledge more broadly, focusing on early modern Europe. Her first book was entitled Knowledge and the Public Interest, 1575-1725, published by Cambridge in 2015. Uh, and just recently, she's finished two related book projects, one entitled Interlopers, Early Stewart Projects and the Undisciplining of Knowledge, which will be published by Johns Hopkins University Press, and Curating the Enlightenment, Johann David Meyer, 1634-1693, and the Experimental Century. She's also edited five collections of essays, uh, and these collaborative with other scholars, one entitled Collective Wisdom, Collecting in the Early Modern Academy, which is forthcoming, Archival Afterlives, Life, Death, and Knowledge Making in Early Modern British Scientific and Medical Archives, Brill, 2018. Critical Bibliography, a special issue of Leas, the Journal for Early Modern Intellectual Culture and Sources, 2017. Science and the Shape of Things to Come, which was a special issue of Early Science and Medicine in 2016. And with Alexander Marr, The Nature of Invention, a special issue of Intellectual History Review in 2014. Her work in the history of learning follows the pathways that learning took in a very distant time, which means that in our terms, she works across fields that we think of in terms of politics, history, medicine, biology, chemistry, technology, philosophy, and art. 
Uh, but even these terms, jarring and jostling as they are, suggest the gap between their world and ours, or between ours and theirs. Um, and so we might even more accurately describe Vera Keller as a historian of the organization of knowledge. And tonight she dips into her knowledge of this world to tell us about one particular kind of knowledge in the 17th century, glass knowledge. The title of her lecture is Hyalomania, Early Modern Glass Research Between the Disciplines. Before she comes to the podium, just a brief word about how tonight's event will run. Uh, Professor Keller will speak here at the podium and then we'll open things up for questions. Those in the room uh, from the BGC are welcome to ask their questions in the old fashioned way. Um, but those of you watching on a screen, please use the Q&A function. We'll monitor that uh, over the course of the talk and uh, present your questions to the speaker. Um, and so with that, it's my pleasure to invite Vera Keller. Thank you so much, Peter, and thank you so much for the invitation. It's a privilege to be here today, and I'm really looking forward to this uh, audience's great questions and comments. So from the midst of our ongoing pandemic, today I will speak on a rather more lighthearted epidemic that struck Europe in the last decades of the 17th century. It was diagnosed by a physician writing in 1685 to the Academy of the Curious About Nature's Journal. Today is Leopoldina, Germany's National Scientific Society. Dr. Lentilius diagnosed himself and most of his contemporaries as sufferers from hyalomania or a glass craze. In this pan to glass, the good doctor identified it as the material for all the great scientific discoveries which he felt characterized his generation. He wrote, without glass, how much about nature would we not know? The little that we do know or that we have explored over the past few years, we owe to glass. We would remain ignorant of the nature of glass itself if we were not able to use glass to penetrate into its most hidden parts. I am hardly able to control myself from the epidemic of hyalomania these past few years, from which hardly anyone today is immune, and through which glasses have attained enormous prices, even hundreds of imperials. The amazing nature of glass has exercised the power of the human mind for many in recent years, bringing with it great pleasure. So it was an enjoyable disease from which to suffer. Lentilius outlined a field of glass research that was more, more coherent at the time than many of us might realize today, even as it merged forms of knowledge from across wide social ranges and purposefully blended artisanal practice and academic theorizing in new ways. This was apparent in the rest of his study, which focused on the rather specific phenomenon of anaclastic glasses, or glasses blown with a very thin curved bottom that could spring between concave and convex forms. Lentilius connected this specific inquiry to a vast range of recent publications on glass. He reeled off a list of now well-known authors writing on the topic in the 17th century from the Florentine Antonio Neri to the Englishman Christopher Merritt, who translated Neri into English, to Germany's own Johannes Kunkel, who translated both Neri and Merritt into German in his experimental glass art, and who would himself be elected to the Leopoldina eight years later. Others, wrote Lentilius, research the porosity of glass, still others, malleability, others, the breaking of glass through the sound of a human voice, and still others, glass drops or tears that explode with a light pressure upon its tip, to the extent that, wrote Lentilius, everywhere you looked, there was something about glass that was being probed and explored. This was the time of the institutionalization of experimental science, or experimental philosophy, as it was then called, through the founding of learned societies and the establishment of the first university chairs and seminars on the topic. At this crucial moment, Lentilius rightly diagnosed the prominence of glass in the experimental studies of his contemporaries. It was a claim to status for glass in emergent experimental philosophy that Kunko was making here when he entitled his work The Experimental Glass Art and included a complicated iconographic program contrasting his own approach through which wisdom is tested by experience in the furnace of trials with the dark error and misguided fantasies of those who rely upon book learning alone. There is a reason why Glass took on such a prominent position in period science besides the vast sums that unusual Glass could command from collectors and besides the utility of Glass for science in the form of lenses, prisms, alembics, air pumps, and other instruments. It was because, as Lentilius also discussed, Glass represented the greatest ambitions as well as the ultimate vanity of humankind. It was the touchstone through which and against which human knowledge of the time measured itself. 
In its amazing transformation from basic materials like sand and ash to a gorgeous glistening substance, glass seemed to embody the human power to transform nature with one weakness, it was breakable. That was why, like the tulips of the better known 17th century mania, tulip mania, broken glass often symbolized the vanity of human ambitions, as in the broken drinking glasses seen here. And such failure at the very cusp of immense ability was magnified by the huge effect of glass's frangibility upon experimentation. Many alchemical recipes, for example, called for weeks of carefully tending incredibly expensive materials in the fire. Imagine what it would feel like to have pursued such a recipe almost to its conclusion, to feel that the great mysteries of nature were almost within your grasp, only to have your flask explode and shatter into pieces, a not uncommon experience for adepts. And here it is, shattering in a great sudden explosion right behind the alchemist. It's somewhat like losing your Word document if that document held your hard-won secrets of the universe. Unbreakable glass was both the acme of human ability to master nature and the key to radically transforming future abilities to know nature, since unbreakable glass would not only be an amazing achievement in and of itself, but its use in scientific instrumentation would enable a whole host of other investigations that were currently impossible. That was why making glass ductile or malleable, that is unbreakable, was one of the famous claimed properties of the philosopher's stone. As Sir Isaac Newton wrote in some of his notes from alchemical classics, the philosopher's stone, supposedly known to ancient adepts, bestowed four powers upon mankind, giving health to men, tinging metals, transmuting ignoble stones into precious gems, and making all glass ductile or malleable. In fact, our self-diagnosed tealomaniac, Dr. Lentilius, classified his own investigation into anaclastic glasses, as well as the many other period forms of glass research he listed, as an attempt to rediscover a claimed ancient ability to produce what was variously called ductile, flexible, or malleable glass. In fact, one might go so far as to say that just as the search for the philosopher's stone was the overarching and ultimate aim for the entire field of alchemy, so too was the search for unbreakable glass, the umbrella quest for the subfield of alchemy, glass making. It was the search for this desired, imagined, and supposedly lost object that gave coherence to a wide range of disparate investigations into glass. Yet, because our histories often focus on surviving objects or upon the documentation of practical recipes, we might easily overlook this overarching aim and dismiss it as a fool's quest, even if such wished for and dreamed of objects remained powerful organizing concepts for centuries. For example, Recipes for softening glass or making malleable glass appear in innumerable manuals, such as this well-known book of illuminators from around 1500, where we find two recipes for softening glass, um, one calling for goat's blood and a strong acid and the other for lovage, salvia, and salt. Or this uh, Dutch manuscript where we have four lessons for softening glass, two of which appear in Latin. And I could multiply this by hundreds of times in different uh, manuscript collections. And these are texts that are regularly mined for knowledge of a wide range of craft techniques. Yet generally speaking, while their practical recipes are studied, these so-called fantastic or magical recipes that coexisted with the practical ones are ignored. Even though recipes for malleable glass continue to appear in manuscript and print collections through the 18th century, with up to nine recipes for softening glass appearing in a single text. And here I give you one example um, from the late 17th century. This is a manual that was compiled by a learned physician, Johann Connolt and Leopoldina member um, from Breslau, who um, in fact includes somewhat more skeptical comments at the end of these recipes than was normal. He says, whoever wishes may test this, I haven't yet tried it myself, and if this is to believe, after another recipe for softening glass. But one would normally uh, very frequently find, even through the 18th century, recipes for softening glass that go without such caveats added to them. Non-existent but widely desired things like malleable glass structure knowledge dynamics. The actual objects and the practical recipes that do survive from the past derived part of their period meaning by participating in those dynamics. Importantly, malleable glass concentrated the pursuit of knowledge around an imagined material object 
rather than around what we call in the history of science, propositional knowledge or a scientific object, like for example, porosity, ductility, malleability, or flexibility. All these properties, as Lentilius noted, were being investigated in the time, but they were experimented upon under the rubric of the imagined material object. This made a difference because this object came with a story that introduced a host of social, political, and other considerations drawn from a wide array of different disciplines, integrating them into the investigation of glass's properties. Moreover, as an object, malleable glass was something that could be desired and served to attract and gather around it connoisseurs, or as they were called in the period, lovers. Love is not an emotion that malleability or ductility will inspire, at least not in me. Lentilius's peers suffered from a mania for malleable glass, not for malleability. In short, the shared desire for an object could join together the efforts of many individuals who participated in a widespread and very long-term quest because malleable glass was infused with emotion, with nostalgia, with layered symbolic meanings, and with relationships to a whole host of other objects and practices. The once famous story about malleable glass was recounted by numerous ancient authors, including Pliny, about an unnamed Roman artisan who wished to gain fame from Emperor Tiberius. Presenting the emperor with a gorgeous glass vessel, the artisan threw it upon the ground, but it did not break. Hammering it back into shape, the artisan expected great honor from the emperor. Tiberius asked him whether he had shared the secrets of this unbreakable glass with anybody. When the artisan assured him that he had not, Tiberius instantly ordered him to be murdered and his entire workshop destroyed, lest this newfound art bring down the price of gold and silver vessels, of which he owned many. This story gave rise to innumerable laments and moral and political reflections over centuries about how invention ought to be pursued and supported. Fault was found both with the artisan, who was too secretive about his process and eager for fame, as well as with the emperor, who thought he was being crafty and calculating, but did not understand the political utility of supporting new inventions like unbreakable glass. Also to blame, wrote the academic alchemist Andreas Lubavius in the early 17th century, were the learned scholars of the time who were not valorizing craft practices sufficiently and making an effort to record artisanal secrets for the benefit of society as they should be doing in any well-constituted republic, and as he was doing in his new discipline of academic al alchemy. The ancient literary sources do not in fact use the term malleable glass, but rather ductile, flexible, or unbreakable glass. In fact, the idea of malleable glass versus flexible glass circulated in rather separate streams until the 16th century. These were literary discussions of the ancient story that referred to flexible or ductile glass, craft recipes for softening glass or making vitra malleable as they were sometimes termed um, even in the vernacular text in Latin and alchemical processes. And the distinction between these last two, obviously they intersect, but it lay in the scale of difficulty that the processes that are recorded suggest. So craft recipes for softening glass coexisted with other, other recipes for softening stone, for example, and the simplicity of their ingredients like lovage or goat's blood and processes suggested that this should be a rather simple achievement. By contrast, in the alchemical tradition, making malleable glass was conceptualized as a major arcanum on a par with or identical to the philosopher's stone. And in the early 16th century, these three traditions, fairly separate for centuries, began to be merged as part of the slow bringing together of craft and learned traditions that make up today's experimental sciences and that we once called the scientific revolution. In a period newly value valuing knowledge mergers, imagine lost objects offered powerful centers around which these various forms of knowledge could coalesce. And ductile or malleable glass was only one of many rumored ancient inventions that moderns thought were lost. And in the late 16th century, this group of lost ancient objects was collected together by the Padua law professor Guido Panciroli in an extremely popular work that contrasted the lost ancient inventions with the newfound discoveries of the moderns. So he originally wrote this only in manuscript in Italian, and it was published posthumously first in Latin translation in 1599 and 1602, and from there translated into many other languages in many editions. And here's one of the uh, frontispiece to a later edition that contrasts the broken lost world of the ancient Romans. Um, it has a, a lost discovery uh, mentioned on the bottom, I'll talk about it in a second. There's two modern discoveries here. We have printing and gunpowder. 
And then um, on the right, we have, from Pancharelli's perspective, a new discovery, the entire new world, um, which includes behind a Native American, the rather ominous figure of a colonizer holding a musket. So it has the relationship between gunpowder, military aggression to uh, new worlds and conquests right there. Um, and as you can see, here's the um, in type that you probably can't see, but you can see the extent of the title page of the table of columns for the, his two books of lost things and newly found things. There are far more lost things in his view than newly found things. So there are 65 lost things, only 25 new inventions. So the moderns were not doing very well, according to Pancharoli. Um, he described his work as though it were an accounting table with um, two columns measuring debits and credits of human ability. And we can see here that the lost ancient world on the one side and in Pancharoli's view, the newfound world on the other and early moderns had lost all those things on the debit side like ductile glass um, versus the credits on the other that included such thing as number one, the new world as a whole, porcelain, silk, gunpowder, printing, et cetera. Yet there was a symmetry between many of the lost and newfound objects that suggested a competition between the two. So for example, Bisus is this lost ancient, very fine uh, material that's actually woven from the um, filaments produced by a marine creature that he contrasts with silk, um, papyrus and paper, clepsydra and clocks. Um, so this symmetry suggests a certain competition and an ability to replace the old with the new or with the refound lost ancient objects. And this powerful comparison between the ancient and the modern proved a spur to many for organizing the advancement of knowledge around the recovery of lost ancient arts, moving as many as possible from the debit into the credit column in order to prove that the moderns surpassed the ancients. Such recovery of ancient lost things gained great prestige in the 17th century, as in the case, for example, of the dying of the motto of the early scientific society, the Royal Society, in the supposedly rediscovered ancient Ty Tyrian purple. And you can see it says over there on the bottom right, Nullius in Werba died in purple. Um, and one last thing in particular captured this lust for recovery of ancient materiality. This was what I had indicated before, this in the bottom of Pancharelli's title page, incombustible oil, supposedly used to keep alight perpetually burning lamps in ancient tombs. There were many Renaissance stories of tombs that were opened with such burning lamps still alit from antiquity, only to be snuffed out with the very first modern air that entered the vault. And this was a material metaphor for the sense that antiquity was almost within grasp, but just barely out of reach. The many inventors in the 17th century of various glow-in-the-dark chemicals or phosphors regularly claimed that they had rediscovered a means of remaking a perpetually burning lamp, and their claims quickly won them international fame and invitations to join learned societies. So it was in the case, for example, of Christian Adolf Baldwin, who was invited to join both the Royal Society and the Leopoldina, and who gave phosphoric automa that he created to both Charles II of England and Leopold I of the Habsburg Empire. Um, this is reimagined here in a later work by Johann Kohlhausen, um, and it shows um, Baldwin's metamorphic um, um, and phosphoric automata, a Habsburg eagle that rose and glowed with the sun, a luminescent imperial orb upon which the name Leopold Schon and a barometric time-telling perpetual motion complete with an artificial sun. So the host of lost desired objects created relationships between objects as much as they did fields around an object. While the much desired malleable glass attached, attracted together a wide population of seekers from different traditions um, relating to glass, it often also related laterally across other lost objects. Thus, for example, in this same text where Baldwin describes his phosphoric inventions, he also recounts all the classical sources on what he calls ductile and malleable glass, detailing his own chemical that he claimed could penetrate the hardest glass and could be compared to the ancient encaustic, another one of Pancharoli's lost things. He could use this, he said, to sculpt images into glass as he had done in the case of a look looking glass he had given to Charles II of England. And the very next invention he lists was his perpetually burning phosphor. Um, in this way, Baldwin competed with other thinkers like Kunkel, whom he discusses here, who likewise investigated a similar constellation of um, lost subjects and related new inventions like phosphors and glass. 
This host of lost things intertwined with new inventions and in with investigations into material ancient objects. So for example, in 1668, Copenhagen professor of medicine, O. Borch, reported finds in Italy of glass vessels of an unknown oil, which he compared to a phosphor he had recently received from a Prague chemical workshop. Manfredo Settola had also informed him concerning the digging up of a whole house in Rome in recent years, this house, where a glass of many kinds had been found many of which had splintered into thin sheets, much like talc or Muscovy glass, which was another common um, candidate for the uh, rediscovered flexible glass. From there, Borch moved into a very lengthy discussion of the question of flexible glass. And indeed, Satala's museum included many samples of ancient glass whose colors and techniques he studied and compared to contemporary glass inventions, such as the contemporary ruby glass that he discusses in number 17, comparing it to an ancient red glass in his collection. The grouping of ancient lost things also appeared often on many wish lists of the period that identified the objects and abilities most desired by mankind and therefore most suitable as targets for a collaborative research agenda. And here is a wish list that was kept by a Leopoldina member, um, Jörg Hieronymus Felsch. He lists um, malleable flexible ductal um, glass as over here on uh, number 44. Um, this is the list of the Oxford Philosophical Society that has number 25 is today glass malleable. And this is a list of Robert Boyle's, which has gone uh, viral ever since it was on view at the Royal Society in 2010. Um, it's a rather amusing list and includes on it the making of glass malleable. The, these collaborative desires supported the constellation of interests that explain why figures like Baldwin and Kunkel received such a warm welcome in learned societies of the period. And many of these desired objects, it should be noted, were also considered by many of the period to be impossible. The idea here was that conjoined efforts could render possible what previously had been out of reach. And also that even if these specific items were not achieved, many other discoveries might be made through the intense efforts that such highly desirable targets would stimulate. The quest for desired things and the comparison of ancient and modern crafts remained an enduring way to measure contemporary human knowledge. Here is one example, for example, uh, in an educational table painted for Archduke Ferdinand in 1769, which places modern forms of knowledge in two columns around lost things, including um, malleable glass, which I've enlarged for you. In fact, the term malleable glass persisted through the 19th century. It was much debated whether silicon and early plastics could be considered ancient malleable glass rediscovered, or whether the ultra strong glass used in the Crystal Palace could be considered that rediscovery. And I won't go into the details of all this, but just to note that this was still a live debate, very lively debate in popular magazines of the time in the mid 19th century. So this incredibly strong power of desired objects was why malleable glass featured in many early modern imagined societies or scientific utopias like Francis Bacon's New Atlantis, a society which enjoyed all the advantages of lost ancient things. An anonymous continuation of the New Atlantis published in 1660 even imagined a gallery of inventors that included a statue of the ancient inventor of flexible glass with in its base a case containing a piece of the original lost material, quote, preserved as a sacred relic in memory of the ancient inventor. In another work based on the New Atlantis, um, that of Johann Daniel Meyer, professor of medicine at Kiel and a member of the Leopoldina, Meyer imagined an aerial kingdom where 100 disciplines had been perfected. This was the realm of the cosmosopes, discovered by a piece of stage machinery, Daedalus, who came to life, escaped from the theater, and flew off to this aerial kingdom of knowledge. There, in the chemical laboratory of the cosmosopes, he discovered that they possessed many lost and desired techniques, including the art of making malleable glass lost since the time of Tiberius. Like Lentilius, who saw glass being investigated on all sides, Daedalus also observed many other forms of glass across the disciplines in the realm of the cosmosopes. For example, flying over to pneumatics, Daedalus saw the cosmosopes experimenting with glass drops whose base could not be broken, even by a hammer, but whose tip, even if it was only lightly touched, would cause the entire piece of glass to shatter into a hundred pieces. This, the Cosmosoft stated, might be considered an unimportant trifle, but in fact, it held great significance for philosophical speculation and was often an entryway to understand much larger and more serious phenomena. And Meyer also noted that his colleague, Kiel mathematics professor Samuel Wright here was publishing on many of the same topics. 
That year, in a dissertation, which I hear shown the third edition, Reiher published on these glass drops, giving a complete history of them, which he had first encountered in the Netherlands in 1656 from a friend who had acquired them from the Amsterdam glass workshop. Reiher investigated, brought some of them himself, brought them back to Germany, where he subjected them to a number of experiments and where he encouraged a local glass workshop to make them for him in a variety of sizes. Then in 1661, a member of the Royal Society, Prince Rupert, introduced these drops to England where they gained their name of Prince Rupert's Drops. They took Europe by storm over the decade of the 1660s and they are just as viral today. On YouTube, you can watch videos of the glass drops and permeability to breaking at its bulb even up against a pneumatic hammer. And on the other hand, the incredible explosion produced when it is broken very slightly at its tip. While today, glass drops might fall under the category of cool science tricks, in the early modern period, they bore other now forgotten significances. For example, in John Evelyn, a member of the Royal Society's copy of the register book of the Royal Society, a poem has been added to a figure of a glass drop on the verge of exploding. It alludes to the explosive violence breaking apart civil society during the interregnum following the decapitation of King Charles I in 1649. The poet writes, so is a kingdom one and strong, but when the top is broken, shivers into men. This poem reminds us of the significance of glass in the time as a measure of human ability and common well being, and the ways that the investigation into glass technologies were constantly being analyzed with reference to social and political structures that could support or destroy knowledge. Indeed, because of the resistance of the bulb of the glass drop to breakage, research into glass drops was classified by contemporaries under that larger rubric of the investigation of unbreakable glass. In a work of 1677, for example, Mayor paired the ancient art of softening glass with the modern art of making glass tears and other similar objects like threads and spirals of glass that easily break. Glass tears were quickly incorporated into the first academic seminars of experimental philosophy and discussed in many new scientific periodicals of the time, including that of the Leopoldina. And Mayor showcased them in a model museum he opened to the public in 1688, a dangerous move because they could explode at any moment. His notes on objects from the early 1690s in his museum indicate that glass drops were then easily available from any forest glassmaker in surrounding Holstein. Now here's his little sketch of a glass drop and his, his notes about it. Glass drops grew to such prominence not only because they were fun and easily obtainable, but because they signified efforts to advance knowledge through experimentation across a wide social realm. The dynamics of researching these glass drops in the Amsterdam glass house and introducing them into learning conversations on experimental science signified a wider desideratum of the period to search for knowledge and not to be like those scholars from the reign of Tiberius who had not made an effort to study and preserve the lost ancient techniques of malleable glass. Experimental philosophers of the period worked to translate the text textual craft and alchemical investigations of glass into the new institutions of experimental philosophy that joined together these pursuits. Thus, malleable glass survived even past major shifts in theories concerning matter. It could even survive a denial of the reality of the philosopher's stone itself. This was the position taken by Johann Kunkel, who was in close contact with Mayor and Reiher setting a keel. Kunkel was the son of the local glassmaker, Jürgen Kunkel, who supplied the laboratory of the local Dr. Court with its specialized glassware. The glass industry in Holstein had first been established by his great uncle, Franz Kunkel, and Johann Kunkel himself supplied Duke Christian Albrecht, the founder of the University of Kiel, with some very expensive glassware. Meyer much admired Kunkel's chemical theories as they appeared in a now lost dissertation Kunkel defended at Wittenberg under the aegis of Meyer's friend, Professor Georg Kaspar Kirchmeier. Kunkel addressed malleable glass and its supposed relationship to the philosopher's stone in his experimental glass art, which became a classic glass manual. As he wrote, quote, as far as the softness of glass is concerned, I let everyone believe what he will. But for my part, I consider that such a thing never existed in nature. But this I do believe, that something just like glass, as far as the appearance and form is concerned, that can bend and yield to hammering can be found or prepared as I know myself how to prepare a transparent cup out of silver, which can be engraved with all sorts of figures and even hammered. Kungel went on to explain that he referred to horn silver or silver chloride, a transparent substance that does not dissolve in water or alcohol, but is soft enough to be cut with a knife. 
due to its low solubility, silver oxide had been used since the ninth century at least as a surface stain or ornament on glass. And in a previous work, Kunkel had described horn silver as looking, quote, so beautiful that one could persuade many that it must be the philosopher's stone in the form of a glass. And I would have thought the same if I could have tinged with the silver at all, but I failed completely. In fact, as Kunkel continued in the experimental glass art, anyone who claimed to have the philosopher's stone that made glass malleable was lying. He did not think that the philosopher's stone ever existed, or perhaps he suggested it was the memory of some amazing glass that had given rise to the whole idea of the philosopher's stone in the first place. For many, identifying a substance like silver chloride that wasn't technically a glass, but had all the properties of softness and transparency was not a means of rejecting, but rather of confirming the possibility of malleable glass. This was because one of the arguments for rejecting malleable glass was the idea that malleability and transparency were contrary properties according to several schools of matter theory that I won't get into now, but I'm happy to Q&A. In 1672, Meyer published an article in the Journal of the Leopoldina that studied the flexibility, softness, connectivity, malleability, tension, and retention of glass from the perspective of the new corpuscular um, philosophy. He had observed a transparent salt that had crystallized into a flexible sheet. Although this wasn't a glass, it showed that transparency and malleability could coexist and thus it supported the possibility that the substance could be discovered in the future. Having staked his claim to the international discussion concerning the possibility of flexible or malleable glass, Mayor then became the dedicatee of the next major publication on the topic. This was a work of his colleague at Kiel, the professor of rhetoric, Daniel Bjorg Morhoff, first published in a Latin work addressed to Meyer in 1672, and then in an unauthorized Dutch translation, on the breaking of glass through the sound of a human voice. It described how, on his way to London to visit the Royal Society, Morhoff stopped off at Amsterdam, where he was introduced by a bookseller to Nikolaus Petter, a famed wrestler. So this is from Petter's wrestling manual, and he has showing off one of his strengths here and another one there in uh, the portrait of him in the unauthorized Dutch translation of Morhoff's work. Rather than showcasing his usual moves, Petter was performing a rather unusual feat in a local tavern where he could break one glass drinking cup after the next through the sound of his own voice. Morhoff was thrilled and he brought it to the attention of the Royal Society where they tried the experiment and failed. And Morhoff records in rather humorous detail his own later efforts to break glass with his voice through various thrill, trills and shouts, can only imagine. He returned to Amsterdam where he admired Petter breaking glass many more times and he wrote it all up in an extensive Latin treatise, further expanded in a later edition, including a very lengthy discussion of the current state of the question of flexible or malleable glass. Morhoff's work illustrates several features of glass research of this period. First, it shows how very specific investigations, like the auditory breaking of glass, were incorporated into larger literature under the rubric of flexible or malleable glass. It also shows the prominence of phenomena drawn from glass workshops and taverns like glass tiers or Petter's performances that was meant to indicate a purposely wide net cast to capture knowledge from across social scales as a way to hunt out secrets of art. Such examples could be magnified many times over. So for example, Old Borch from Copenhagen discussing the possibility of recovering flexible glass described street performers he had seen in both Lyon and Copenhagen that twirled molten glass about into thin flexible threads that could even be hammered. Investigators of lost flexible or malleable glass joined charlatans performances with the discussions of the latest matter theory, trips to glass workshops, and even the search for and study of ancient samples of glass. Importantly, they fused all this together around one imagined, desired, and legendary thing. And the story behind this object was important because it offered a unified aim that could collect disparate but related investigations. It was a story that had long been interpreted to be about the shared responsibility of artisans, scholars, and the state to communicate, investigate, and preserve technology. This purposeful merging of knowledge across social statuses can complicate the way many historiographies currently classify glass research of the researchers of the period. For example, Kunkel is often characterized as an alchemist whose work at various courts placed him in a trading zone between scholars and craftsmen. However, we can also consider the way that academics also work to build trading zones and how Kunkel participated in this institutionalization of academic experimentalism and in learned societies. Kunkel himself made a claim to the status in the title of his books, including his later Collegium Physico-Chemicum Experimental. 
So to his contemporaries, this would have read as the title of an account of an academic experimental course, looking, doing a word search for Collegium Experimental in a combined database of 18th century German um, speaking realms publications, we see that Kunkel is the only non-professor who uses this in the title of his works. All the others are referring to various experimental courses uh, being offered at gymnasia and universities of the time. So the title refers back to Kunkel's own education and his early experience as a pedagogue. When he studied at Wittenberg, he tells us there was no quote, Collegium Chemicum Experimental offered. So his friend and patron, Professor Georg Kasper Kirchmeier, let him teach his own, but he didn't find teaching as rewarding as he had thought he would. By the time Kunkel polished his, published his own Collegium, students could take hands-on experimental seminars at universities across German-speaking lands, including much experimentation with glass. The incredible fusion of forms of knowledge in which Kugel's work appeared was embodied inhumanely in one object with which I will conclude. This was a glass that Leopoldina member Johann Christian Kuhnmann described in 1737. Kuhnmann, like many of his fellow Breslauers, such as Johann Daniel Mayer, was very interested in digging up ancient burial mounds in order to study the material culture of so-called pagans. Such digs produced a wide range of materials from stone to human bones, to ceramics, glass, and metals. The contemporaries studied using the tools of experimental philosophy, especially when the identity of these objects was poorly known or fused together, as Meyer emphasized in an example of a fused piece of bone and glass. And he had to use his knowledge of chemistry in order to interpret what this originally might have been. Kuhnmann also noticed how glass appeared sometimes fused within burial urns, sometimes with bones. And he decided to merge this observation with the latest glass technologies by using a rediscovered technique that Kunkel had communicated to him to produce a fine milky glass, similar to porcelain, through the use of human bones. Kunman asked area investigators of burial mounds to give him the bones they found of so-called pagans, which he then had processed into a fine bone drinking glass. On this, he had a Latin inscription engraved, asking the drinker to pour out a libation to the poor heathens who, after suffering two deaths, first on the field of battle, then in the furnace of the glass house, were now experiencing the pains of hellfire. In this way, research into glass literally dug it up from the burial mounds of antiquity, rematerializing it in the modern world as the ultimate fusion of varying forms of matter of knowledge, and here, quite gruesomely, people. Thank you. So the, the floor in the room is open for questions and also through the ether. Yeah. Uh, so I was very interested in what you were talking about the fact that some people saw transparency and malleability as commensurate. Right. So were there some who like specifically looked at clouded or colored glass as a path towards flexible glass? Um, the clouding of it would be what uh, they were trying to get rid of. So that would not be a path forward because um, that would be a way out of the problem of the of the incommensurability. Um, the incommensurability was something that both um, Kind of the alchemical tradition suggested, um, and in fact, I can show you some quotes related to that. Uh, oh, I didn't include it. Never mind. Um, so um, the issue was that um, the basic nature of metals um, was different from glass, in that metals supposedly included this um, sulfur, um, an invisible sulfur that was what gave it its unctuous material materiality and thus its malleability. Whereas glass was seen to be a compound that therefore was not able to have um, that kind of inner sulfur inside of it. And that is uh, particularly one of the theories that Meyer attacks because he shows, he argues that we don't need to refer to these unctuous principles. He's really eager as a Kaparskova philosopher to get away from principles in general and thinking about the structure of nature. Um, the other argument against it came from corpuscular philosophers who thought that transparency was allowed by pointy corpuscles that just barely touched. And so they allowed light to pass through, whereas malleability was allowed by things that were very densely intermeshed and therefore um, were kind of soft like a cloth. 
And there, Meyer argued that you could have curved or interlinked armor-like corpuscles that could still bend, but could also have space for light to pass through. So he was attacking um, both um, schools of thought, but not through cloudy glass, because um, cloudy glass would let you say, well, it's cloudy, so therefore it's uh, not got such a, a tight um, corpuscular structure as transparent glass would require. Yes, Andrew. Um, thank you very much. That's absolutely fascinating. Um, you, you, you mentioned um, that um, malleable glass uh, intervened or, or you know, was uh, featured, as it were, in more philosophical conversations about mm -hmm. the nature of matter. Mm -hmm. I just wondered where Mayor stood within those debates. Well, he was a very prominent participant um, since he was a member of Leopoldina and since he um, taught an experimental seminar that was quite innovative um, and he was very, very much involved in those. Uh, Georg Hasbar Kirchmeier, his good friend, um, also um, he facilitated a conversation between Kirchmeier and the Royal Society. So um, there was a kind of international component to this, to, to this conversation, as you also saw in the case of Morhoff going over to the Royal Society. So it was um, not just in the Leopoldina's conversation, but also internationally between societies that um, these conversations were taking place. Does that answer your question or did you ask anything? Yeah, so sort of philosophical level of oh. the nature of matter mm -hmm. itself. I mean, in the more abstract uh, conversation, mm -hmm. did, did the practicals of, of, of malleable glass feature at all? What's, in a sense, you're answering the question, but um, I, I just wondered if there are more um, abstract philosophical works, natural philosophy rather than natural history, for, you know, as it were. Um. Well, his, uh, his work on the, the, art, the periodical observation um, on the, that I was just discussing the corpuscular theory that he put forward in the periodical of the Leopoldina, it's fairly abstract. I mean, he gets really into atomic theory uh, and then connects it to this one little observation that he saw in this vial where there was this concrescence of salt and he then extracts from that out to the whole idea of malleable glass. So that's one area I would say that the plane on which he's talking about it is a fairly elevated uh, discussion of matter theory. Yeah. Thank you so much. So interesting. I'm, my mind is slightly blown by these glass drop things, but I'm gonna explore that through my own. <laughs> Um, I wanted to just come back to your the point you made at the very beginning that the defect of glass is that it you know that it breaks mm -hmm. and I had not heard the story of Tiberius which is very interesting um, and I confess I'm really captivated by those lists of things we wish you know we could invent mm -hmm. so I'm just wondering in your travels of sort of fantasies about malleable glass or ductible glass or any, any of these things. Do you have a sense of what they wanted to do with it once it was discovered? Mm -hmm. I mean, the examples that you gave were all kind of preventing vessels or bowls or glasses, you know, from breaking or you know, causing them to break, which suggests they were thinking only at the level of drinking glasses that wouldn't smash or perhaps mm -hmm. that wouldn't smash. But at the beginning, you know, you were talking about how glass pervades everything we're doing, right? right. So what do you think they what, what do you think they wanted to do with flexible glass mm -hmm. did they write about this did they fantasize mm -hmm. how would they have applied this invention if they had found it uh i think on two different levels would be appropriate to answer one is that um on these lists of desires they're very different from the kinds of lists that we would um have today well so for example so these began to be called desiderata and the um uh, 17th century based on something that, you know, based on Francis Bacon's ideas. And there's this very famous poem, Desiderata, from like the 1920s, Max Ehrlich. It shows up on college posters all the time. And that poem is all about a quiet moment, serenity, a few friends, not many things. So we're often wishing for fewer things in the world and kind of a reduction and an escape from multiplicity. And one of the interesting contrasts between our desires and their desires is that you never see on these lists an absence of things. So for example, they never wish for an absence of disease. They wish for a medicine that can cure all disease, right? 
Um, so it's um, a desire for more and more things in the world, stronger and stronger, more and more durable, brighter colors, greater materials. So the material imaginary of these utopias is always full of a multiplicity of things that are stronger, that are better, that are more enduring, perpetual flames, perpetual motions, unbreakable glass as a way to show human mastery over transients and our own mortality. So there's that. Uh, they're kind of wishing that they had plastic. <laughs> uh, and it's kind of a terrible way in order to set up our own era of materiality, right? We, exactly. And that's kind of what they were hoping for. We have realized that we have realized the dark side of it. Um, although I will note that Mayor started his full utopia actually with a dystopia. Before he started, he said, actually, I think a lot of new inventions have been terrible for humankind. I think that printing has just produced pornography, right? Um, all these things have been bad. I think that we're soon gonna discover flight. And when we do, we're gonna have flying chevaliers, knights in the sky shooting cannons down at us and all of our cities will be covered with iron nets to protect them from this aerial warfare. He had a very dark vision of what future invention held. And then he said, well, let's think about something nicer. And he launches off into this dream of the Cosmosoft's kingdom. So he actually had a dystopian vision of what all this invention could lead to. And that was already in 1670. Um, so it was possible to imagine that even then. Um, but in general, what they are imagining is more stuff, more and more durable stuff to fill the world. And you'll notice that their vision of the new world, quote unquote, is a very empty place, right? Compared to their view of Pantrelli's, or that title page's um, view of ancient Rome, which was kind of full of materiality breaking in every direction. And so they're kind of imagining this empty future that they want to fill with their own new stuff. Um, so that's one answer. The other answer is something that gets talked about a lot in the period, which is if we only had unbreakable glass, there are so many processes that are out of reach right now um, because fire is too strong for our glass, can't take it. And there are many, many things, uh, chemical operations that can't be performed with current glass technology. If we had unbreakable glass, the door floodgates would open for chemistry. And in fact, that is what happened. Um, a lot of historians of chemistry talk about a glass revolution. Um, that was what necessary for organic chemistry to happen. Yeah. Yeah, oh, I, that was really interesting. Thank you. I was wondering about um, an art historical perspective on some of the imagery, mm -hmm. especially in terms of the Americas and yeah. the exploitation, the colonial exploitation of indigenous people. And I think one of the images was of, a, of an African person. Um, and I'm thinking, uh, I was wondering if you could talk us through um, so symbolically then, if glass was kind of the epitome of European uh, civilizing invention, yeah. and these juxtapositions of bodies of um, the exploited and enslaved other, um, what materially is going on with the logics then of invention mm -hmm. in that sense, as it's then represented through the visual culture of the scientific discovery, if you will? Yeah. Um, I don't know about, uh, if I could speak to that from the visual culture, um, I could speak to it more in terms of the materiality of specific objects that are on the list of, uh, Petrol's new invention. So one very interesting one from that perspective would be on the newfound things, number five, sugar. Um, and Eric Ochunba has a really interesting article exactly on this topic where he talks about the ways that period, uh, people in the 17th century discussed sugar and enslavement in relationship to newfound things. In fact, there's this whole um, history of the Caribbees from the late 17th century that refers to Pancioli and discusses sugar and enslavement as one of the great newfound things. So enslavement was considered part of these wonderful new discoveries in the 17th century. And it's discussed that way by experimental philosophers of the period, including Robert Boyle, who specifically points to sugar as one of the wonderful things that experimental philosophy can make possible. Thank you. Yeah. Um, this was really fascinating, um, not least because there's, as you know, tons written about this, their search for porcelain mm -hmm. and, and that as this sort of new material that has many of the same, the desires and they actually do 
fine. Of course, you know, they figure it out. So is there a sense in which um, people trying to create malleable glass were using that as a parallel and thinking, well, okay, you know, we found porcelain now, what's, what, what's the next thing here? And how do those two discourses differ? That's really my question. Yeah, so one of the odd things you'll notice is that porcelain isn't listed under the lost thing, it's listed under the newfound things. Um, so it's not available to Europeans uh, and searched for by Europeans, but it's well known that it's available to other people. Um, and so therefore it is on Pancharelli's newfound thing. So that's a kind of twist on this dynamic is that uh, European investigators were also trying to get the secrets of things that were new discoveries by um, cultures out of their re reach, like porcelain. But there is obviously a crossover that already came up uh, in the discussion of Kuhnmann's, uh, um, the bone glass um, technique that he had learned from Kunkel and how he said it's, you know, just as, you know, white and perfect as the finest porcelain. So there is this um, kind of con you know, comparison and um, contest. And a lot of the people um, who are studying these questions are also studying porcelain. So um, one of the major categories of Mayor's um, collection was porcelain. He had a lot of porcelain in his collection. He was studying with his students alongside last year's, et cetera. So it coexisted in the same kind of constellation of pursuits. Yeah. I have a question from uh, Evan Gaskell. He asks, did the observation of glass that had been buried and that had acquired iridescence enter the story? Yes. <laughs> uh, that already appears in um, Setela's, uh, I showed a little clip from Setela's museum catalog and he talks about the um, iridescent quality that appears on very glass and that is something that um, get does it get discussed by um, experimental philosophers on a fairly regular basis? Yeah, I, Peter. If there's, is there anybody else that you're that you have there? No, you can go. I well, at the risk of completely um, putting myself out there, mm -hmm. I, as I as I understand it, and I am not a material scientist. I wish Jen Mass were here because she might be able to speak to this. But as I understand it recent work on glass has determined that it actually does, that it is in motion in yes. certain ways, right? Glass is not, as as we once thought, a, a, it, it has different sort of properties that are, that are observable with a microscope and under magnification that the molecules are in motion mm -hmm. and that it is in a sense, you know, if it's not malleable, it's certain, certainly moving. Yeah. And I wonder whether that's something that, was, was there any, possible way that that could have been surmised? I mean, were they looking at, at this under the microscope at all? Was there they a chemical not, understanding of glass? They were not looking at that feature of glass to my knowledge. I mean, yes, even today we can surmise that by looking at windows and old buildings and seeing that they're thicker at the base than at the top, right. but I don't see that coming up in conversations at the time. Um, however, it is interesting, and I would like to follow this one day kind of as a concepts project, the fact that plastics in itself is called by chemists a flexible glass today. Yeah. yeah. Can I ask you a question about the, the nature of kind of how scientific inventions are envisaged because you talked about utopias before. Mm -hmm. um, so am I right? You, you explained to us that utopia, I mean, scientific utopias were envisaged as being things being better, more faster, more colorful, and whatever else. Um, and that's really different from how we tend to envisage scientific utopias today, such as transhumanism, mm -hmm. where an, a new subject comes into being. There's mm -hmm. a complete kind of, sort of ontological break. And I wanted to ask you, are there instances in that list where there are speculations around something really new happening? Because he's, um, the question sort of elicited around, about glass, um, Jeffrey's question elicited right. a kind of problem. Well, in the period, um, the major, there's two major contests going on, right? Antiquity and modernity and art and nature. And so what proponents of experimental science are trying to prove is the status of human um, art to know over nature, to conquer nature, to master nature. Um, and so they wouldn't be interested necessarily in transhumanism. They're interested in the human, right? The, 
this is a period which is uh, very eager to showcase why it is that we do have power and we could have more power in the future because there are voices in the period that are saying you cannot know nature through um, experimental science because humans um, are weakened by original sin. They are below nature. They are below God. They do not have the ability to know a master um, nature through art. So the main, main objective in these utopias is the category of the human rather than something else or something new, um, but a stronger, better human um, in order to kind of make that leap to an exper the vision of an experimental future. However, I will add as a footnote to that, that um, in historiography of science fiction, um, I have read um, that, you know, science fictions of this period don't feature, you know, androids or machineries as subjects, but the example I just gave you does. So the main um, narrator and hero of Mayor's Voyage to New World Without a Sea Sail is an automaton that is a thinking and self-willed automaton. So it's a kind of interesting twist on that question. Yeah. I mean, the, the interest in malleable glass um, comes from uh, within a group that sees the utility of such a thing for increased scientific investigation. Yeah. So I'm wondering, is there a similar lust for glass that occurs in, a, in um, aesthetic literature? Or d d is there an aesthetic component mm -hmm. to the literature on malleable glass also? Mm -hmm. um, I think that there is, and not about um, the um, visual form, but I think that that poem that I gave uh, from the papers of the Royal Society would be one example of that. Um, the poetic aesthetics of glass there, I think, are very evocative. Um, so there is definitely that um, um, aesthetic sense. And um, there is, of course, the entire visual tradition uh, of breaking glass that I alluded to. However, there's something bizarre. Um, and that is that you cannot find an episode of the story of Tiberius and the malleable glass depicted in Right. So there's a study, for example, of works of art that were inspired out of Pliny. There's 160 episodes in that study from Pliny. They do not include <coughs> glass. So it's very interesting that this thing exercised such a huge um, lure, uh, allure over the imagination. But uh, in terms of depicting it visually, you cannot find a visual depiction of the story. So it's, it's, it's odd. And I've been wondering about this myself. And even in that um, one visual depiction that appeared in that educational table, um, it's interesting that the, um, uh, that the allusions to it are putting it in a kind of medieval alchemical setting rather than in an ancient Roman one. So um, where is that? Um, the Archduke, um, it has stained glass windows in the background and it's in a laboratory setting. And so you can see that it um, aesthetically is supposed to be fairly medieval um, in its reference rather than ancient That's, Roman. That is. Right. Yeah. I mean, this isn't about malleability, but I'm just thinking that one of the great things that they want to just to do with glass that you know was always spawning invention or you know new experimentation was to make larger pieces of it. Mm -hmm. And the first thing they did with that was make mirrors, you right. know, which it's, it's, I think, interesting to think about what, what, why they wanted these things, which maybe we would always guess. Mm -hmm. um, well, we could go on for a long time about mirrors. <laughs> maybe we shouldn't. I'd love to talk to you more about that later. Mirrors are also on the category of lost objects in Pantroli because there are a number of famous mirrors from antiquity. Um, and one of them is right there, the burning mirror of Archimedes. Um, and so mirrors also figure very largely in this literature on the lost things and kind of um, competing with that technology. Yeah. 
Is the, the, la the final object you discussed, is this, uh, do you think this is actually an object? Was it actually made? It was actually an object. And in fact, I can trace it through to the 19th century. It was still in this museum in Wroclaw, or, to, or Breslau, uh, and it's cataloged in a catalog of Silesian glasses in the 19th century. I don't know what happened to it during the war. So I haven't been able to trace it uh, right now. And I haven't had a chance to go to Wroclaw um, and try to figure it out. I think they suffered pretty heavy damage um, during World War II. Um, so I'm not sure that it has survived that. But if it was anywhere, it's probably there now in the National Museum. Is there, have you talked to any sort of class, actual scientist or somebody to, to understand what this would have done perhaps to a glass recipe adding bone into it. And... Oh, that is, I mean, that is published upon and, and well known. It, it, that would, that is not a fantasy recipe that does work. So this bone glass, and there are other surviving, you know, examples of this bone glass that, and it doesn't have to be human bones like Kudman was using. Uh, it can be animal bones, but yeah, that's a, a known technique. And it makes it opalescent, white and opalescent. Um, and that opalescence, again, goes back to the question about the iridescence. I think that there's a kind of competition there between the, the opalescence of this white glass and the iridescence of ancient glass. Yeah. I'm just, just thinking about, um, yes, the, the, the analogies with um, porcelain again, because of course mm -hmm. bone china can such a sort of, uh, in England, become such a thing from the late 18th century onwards. Um, the addition of bone rather than um, forms of clay. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just thinking, did uh, von Chernhaus in Dresden, who did work with glass and I think actually developed um, molded glass, so mm -hmm. he could make these huge uh, lenses mm -hmm. uh, sort of a meter across um, to make his, his burning right. machines and so on, and then went into this sort of porcelain. Mm -hmm. um, was he at all concerned with these kinds of issues? Uh, I'm sure he was, yeah. but I would have to look it up. I don't know off the top of my head, but he's a very interesting figure. There is so much more work to be done on him and Johann Daniel Croft and all of these figures. There's a lot of um, correspondence and manuscripts uh, that one could still research. So um, very fascinating group of people in this whole uh, late 17th century German environment. Um, and so Turnhouse would definitely be a place to go. But at the top of my head, I don't know. We have a question from one of our uh, alums. Thank you, uh, from Katie Tice. Uh, thank you for this fascinating talk. I'm wondering where career glassmakers fit in to this conversation with natural philosophers and scientists. Mm -hmm. Is there any evidence that they were consulted or, or, and or are there any opinions of glass blowers on the malleability of glass? Or were these experiments taking place separately from the glass industry? Mm -hmm. I do not think they're taking place separately because the very um, kind of collections of recipes that are seen as the go-to place for craft recipes for actual practice of the period all include malleable glass uh, recipes. So I think that there was a conversation that was happening um, in these settings. And those settings are being explored by these experimental philosophers who are visiting glass workshops whenever they can in Amsterdam and Holstein um, and wherever they are. It's a very good question. Um, but what's interesting to me, to me too is also to think about figures like Kunkel and think about the way that these conversations can transform someone's career. So Kunkel's whole family were career glass makers. But the reason why Kunkel was able to stake a claim um, and defend a dissertation at Wittenberg and, have, and be elected to the Leopoldina and have this role in experimental philosophy is because experimental philosophy was interested in career glassmakers and in these in exploring these questions and kind of created a space that Kunkel could then enter. So we often think of people like Kunkel as promoters, um, self-made projectors who are somewhat maybe deceivers who are staking claims and making ambitions of their own. And what I'm trying to do here is point to this kind of overarching um, arena that includes alchemy and it includes craft traditions and it includes learned classical scholarship that is creating a space for figures like Kunkel who otherwise would have been a career glassmaker to be an experimental philosopher. 
do if I could just follow on. Do these lists um, only come from the learned, or just to follow along the spirit of the question, mm -hmm. are artisans also looking for these things? I think that um, where these lists I have found them have been in learned archives. That does not to say that that's that these same categories are not uh, motivating the researches of other people. So I think that the category that the categories that a lot of artisans are working in correspond not coincidentally to these lists because these are the kinds of things that people are interested in knowing and in having, and so therefore. Um, that's what people are working on. Um, so to give my example that I know best, Cornelis Drebbel, wonder worker from the Netherlands, active in early Stuart, England. Um, he was working on a lot of items that appear on these lists to the extent that his name appears on these lists. There are lists that include his machines and inventions, such as his submarine or his famous perpetual motion on things that people want there to be in the world which is a really interesting move because it means that the people keeping those lists who are um, sometimes statesmen, sometimes um, scholars, don't believe him, right? They think that what he's doing is, is very desirable, but they don't believe that he's necessarily actually achieved it. Um, and they're gonna put it on this list as a, as a future uh, research and development objective, as it were. Um, so putting something on these lists isn't necessarily a compliment to that person. It could be a skeptical move saying that um, we don't quite believe that this exists. One of the kind of mind-blowing things that I realized when I was researching Francis Bacon is that um, in one part of his natural philosophy, he writes about charlatans' promises and how um, horrible they are because all of this has a long list of charlatans' promises. Uh, they're so terrible because they doom any man's great ambitions because anytime someone comes along and says they want to do something great, people say, oh, that's just what people in the marketplace are always claiming that they can do. Um, and um, he then has a list, uh, uh, wish lists that he publishes at the end of New Atlantis, which is verbatim the charlatan's promises. So he has kind of structured the wish list based on charlatan's promises, not because he believes that they're achievable, but because he thinks that they have been shown in the marketplace to be a very effective lure um, that people really, really want and will bring and bring folks together. And in fact, um, and I have a chapter about this in my book, Knowledge of Public Interest, there is um, a very extensive pamphlet literature about the Rosicrucians um, that emerges in the uh, second decade of the 17th century that cites Pancharoli's list chapter and verse. That these are exactly what the Rosicrucians are supposed to produce, um, including malleable glass. Yeah. I just, yeah, just following up on that, is there a sense that the, the, the market, I mean, the 18th century is obviously time of classically looked at as the birth of consumer society and all that. Is the market demanding malleable glass or is this something that's that's coming more out of this, this kind of learned group of scientific experimenters, you know, or what's the relationship between some kind of imagined market and mm -hmm. um, the learned societies? So I would um, respond to that two ways. One is people wanted malleable glass for millennia. <laughs> so it appears on manuscripts centuries for centuries and centuries and centuries. So it is definitely not an 18th century market phenomenon. Um, but the other thing that they wanted was some sense of coherence in society. And that is something that Glass was also an emblem for, as you saw in that one poem, and I could give other examples of that. And so part of um, these, utopias of the period that was imagining this human civilization that would be stronger, have more things, healthier, brighter, more enduring, was also um, socially and politically more cohesive um, because falling apart, um, as it was called a catalysis, utter dissolution, was something that people experienced in various um, revolutions and wars of the 17th century. It was a huge fear of the time and it was discussed in the period. Uh, politically. And so very interestingly, people imagined ways that desired objects could be that lure around which civilization could join. So for example, 
um, the 1660 continuation of the New Atlantis, in addition to having the statue of the flexible glass, also has a lost amazing magnet that is able to bring together all of society so that it shall never dissolve again. <laughs> so that is part of the imagination. On the other hand, just as in tulip mania and its criticism of the marketplace, as Anne Golgar discusses in her book on the topic, um, there's also a criticism of the social um, disjuncture and violence that lusting after consumer goods can bring about. And here I would um, point to um, Johann Valentin Andrea, who was a very influence, influential Lutheran writer who writes a lot of satires about desired objects and um, marketplaces full of things where in the rush for these objects, and he includes perpetual motion and malleable glass and many of these other famed ancient things among them. He describes crowds of people throwing themselves at it so that they trample and kill each other so that they're buried in the, in the gold that they're throwing at it. So there's also a criticism of consumerism and what people are noticing in terms of the, the lust and the mania and the rush for these things. Yeah. In, in, in the list of <laughs> in the list of lost things, was that was that anything that came from cultures other than antiquity? Uh, yeah. Um, other than antiquity, meaning prehistoric. No, I mean, it could be contemporary exotic cultures. To China exotic. or yes, India? Exactly. No, because those would be on the newfound things if they existed anywhere in the world. Um, so what's really interesting also is the moment of the division between ancient and lost world, which is the fourth century for Pancioli. So there's a lot of inventions from the 13th century or late antiquity that go on the new inventions. And that was where he conceptualized his distinction between antiquity and modernity. But porcelain, for example, and that for that reason is among the, the newfound things, not that any European could produce porcelain in the period, but someone in the world could, so it's there. Yeah. <laughs> in the debates about and the search for porcelain, mm -hmm. say in the um, Academie des Sciences in, in, in France, um, it's interesting that Chinese porcelain is used almost in a similar way to uh, malleable grass in the sense that they're quite satisfied if they can find an equivalent right. substance that they know isn't using the Chinese uh, ingredients precisely, but will do, you know, will I look know. more or less the same. So people like uh, Ramu yeah. and uh, Hilo, uh, you know, talk in these terms. That's what I find so fascinating about this whole thing. And that's one reason why Pancheroli becomes such a huge topos that people keep returning to, because it offers you so much fuel for debate. Were these things ever lost? Were they ever found? What were they exactly? Does this count as that thing? You could go back and forth endlessly on that topic. And horn silver is a great example where the same substance, some people say, well, this is malleable glass. And other people say, this proves that malleable glass never existed because it was really this thing, right? So you can use the existence of the same object to talk on either side of the question. Follow up Andrew's question. Yeah. If, um, if things from other cultures mm -hmm. are away, are placed in the found object section. Is that, do you think, because of a lack of knowledge of those cultures and such that he's unaware of what could have been lost in those cultures? Or is it a, a, a more principled statement that in China or India, for instance, nothing was lost? Mm -hmm. I do not think that it's a principled statement that in China or India, nothing was lost. Um, I also do think that he is a very informed individual. He had access to fairly extensive um, ducal collections um, and is clearly very well aware with a wide array of global objects. Um, so he's, he's very well informed. He's in fact an extremely learned scholar um, and this discourse of his doesn't do justice to his scholarship because it was meant as a kind of courtly discourse. So in the vernacular, and it was meant to be. And in, in the his bit about it is actually quite small, um, and then it's commented upon at great length by a German jurist. Um, so I, I think he's very well aware. The critical thing is that there had been another literary technology for collecting knowledge from around the world that vastly predated wish lists and wish lists come out of Pantroli's lists, I argue, um, and that is query lists. So query lists are very well-known you know, technique for 
investigating, using it to travel, going around the world and investigating what various cultures have, um, hopefully in order to bring it back to your own civilization to enrich it. Um, and that would have been the, the standard way to investigate things that are around the globe. Um, but this idea of things that are gone, right? Nada, does not exist, have been, have been killed, you know, in the case of Malleable Glass in this very violent way. That is a different category. Uh, that is not just elsewhere, that is gone. Um, and so Pancharli is very clear about that distinction and so is everybody who's citing him. Yeah, there are no more questions. Um, before we thank you, just to say that those who are tuning in and those in the room, uh, our next event is right here on Thursday at 12.15 Eastern time when Charmaine Nelson uh, will be speaking to us. The talk is entitled Justice, Property and Punishment, the role of Montreal Sheriff Edward William Gray in 18th century Quebec slavery. So we look forward to that. Um, and we thank you, Vera Keller, very much for tonight's lecture. Thank you.